Kia ora, and welcome to the Reserve Bank's panel discussion on the latest monetary policy statement. I'm Patrick O'Mara. Uh, the global economy continues to be tested by COVID-19 and trying to contain the virus. In New Zealand, we did enjoy a relaxation of restrictions and a recovery in economic activity. But this virus uh, is not easily subdued and the government has since reimposed some restrictions to contain an outbreak, mainly in Auckland. Now, in last week's Monetary Policy Statement Review, the Monetary Policy Committee, or MPC, held the official cash rate at 0.25% and agreed to take further steps to support full employment and keep inflation stable. It expanded the Large Scale Asset Purchase, or LSAP, program to $100 billion and asked Reserve Bank staff to prepare a package of additional tools to be available if required. The package includes a negative OCR supported by funding uh, retail banks near the OCR at 0.25%, and it's called the Funding for Lending Program. Well, to discuss the decision further, I'm joined on this Zoom call by the bank's chief economist and MPC member, Jung Ha, and MPC external member, Bob Buckle. We'll also put some of your questions to them that you've kindly sent in. Well, Jung, if I could uh, start with you first and just look at the economic uh, outlook, like how much did the recent COVID restrictions um, being reimposed contribute to the August MPS decision and lifting LSAT purchases to 100 billion? Uh, kia ora. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Patrick. Um, yeah, um, I think the re-entering of, of social restrictions is one of the risks that we were very mindful of. Um, and we talk about scenarios and the risks to those scenarios, and there was always the possibility that we would have these sort of rolling mall of, of lifting and, 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 and unlifting of, of restrictions. So that definitely played a, a part in the decision. Um, we are mindful that the economy is going through a long, gradual recovery, and it would need more monetary support through out, which is why we decided to lift the LSAT program from the 60 billion total to a, a target of up to 100 billion. Um, Bob, do you have any particular reflections on, on that? Uh, thank you, Jung, and Cure, everyone. Um, th th that's, that's correct. The, um, the projections do take account of the considerable uncertainty uh, that uh, we face. And that, that uncertainty is very evident uh, from surveys of the business community, the household community, and it impinges on decisions to invest by firms, decisions to employ more staff, uh, spending decisions. So the expansion of the LSAT program gives us greater scope to either act more aggressively at an appropriate time and to operate the, the program a bit longer. Um, you know, can I go back to you again, just around the uh, risk that you see you, you, for the outlook? They very much to the downside, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, you can make um, a reasonable case that there are upside risks as well. But when you sort of look at the magnitude and, and I guess the, the balance of risks, um, we're more likely to experience sort of um, downside risks that really matter for the economic recovery. Um, economic upside risks we welcome, um, but are they enough to really shift the dial on what we need to do with um, monetary policy and, all, and a broad range of economic policies? I guess that's sort of where the, the balance of risk discussion lies. Well, but um, I guess how concerned are you about expectations for both uh, inflation and employment? Uh, they're an important consideration, uh, Patrick, in our decision making and our assessment of the situation. Um, one of the things you don't want to see is that uh, expectations of falling inflation, expectations of falling employment, uh, uh, feed on each other and they of course will impinge on individuals decisions uh, about employment, uh, firms decisions about employment uh, and will impinge on confidence. So it is important that we uh, take that into consideration and of course the, the, the Monetary Policy Committee's mandate is to um, maintain inflation within our target band between um, which is and, and try and converge on the two percent, and uh, maintain employment near uh, near its uh, maximum sustainable level. So those are important considerations for us. But we certainly 
Um, our role is to provide the support to the economy uh, and try and uh, help uh, lift some confidence and um, manage those expectations. Young, uh, Adrian or the Governor has in the past talked about um, the persistence of unemployment being a crucial factor for the economy uh, looking ahead. I guess, how closely are you watching the labour market at this time? Oh, very closely. Um, we understand there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the in the data. Um, and so the, the data itself won't give a, a complete picture. So we need to calibrate and understand holistically what's going on. To date, a lot of the support policies through the wage subsidies and the like have, have been very successful at retaining um, people in employment, um, but we know that a lot of these support measures can't go on indefinitely. So there is actually a lot of hard work ahead and we are very conscious that um, some tough decisions will probably need to be made. And um, our, that's our role as monetary policy to basically support the recovery by having a very clear focus on um, the employment side of our, of our dual mandate. You know, I might just ask you a follow-up question that which has come from the public from a, a Josh Bannon um, and it, I guess it really does strike to the heart of the uncertainty. Uh, he wants to know what kind of analysis has been done of predictions and decisions compared with what the actual outcomes are. Yeah, that's a great question Josh. Um, so a couple of ways I'd answer that is you know there's always the ongoing um, uh, cross check on our thinking through we update our forecast every six weeks so staff go out um, look at the data talk to businesses um, talk to households to get a sense of what's happening we try and calibrate that with um, the data we're seeing and then seeing what our forecasts were six weeks ago so we're continually testing our understanding of the economy um, then occasionally we you know, actually periodically we, we do a much deeper dive in our forecasting um, approach. So we, I guess a forecast performance benchmarking exercise that happens probably every four to five years when we actually have a collection of enough data to sort of take a look back and make sure we're not doing anything systematically. Um, you know, there aren't any rooms for systematic improvement in our forecast performance. It's, it's forecasting and producing predictions is a, is a tough game. Um, in our last forecast performance, we um, the research results were published back in 2016. So we're probably due for, for another uh, look at some of our forecasting performance, but that'll probably be um, next year or the year after before we, we take a deeper dive into that stuff. Let's turn to the LSAT program. Expanded from 60 billion up to 100 billion. You've extended the length of time that you'll be looking to buy. I guess the question for a lot of people out there, is this LSAT program making a difference? Oh, um, absolutely. I mean, I've always described the LSAT program as basically another way to lower retail interest rates for households and businesses. So when you look at that metric, um, you know, the mortgage rates are probably the most obvious example that people can relate to. Um, you know, across the spectrum, they're, they're falling between, you know, 75 basis points at the, the floating mortgage rate spectrum all the way up to your fixed mortgage rates, which are down by, uh, in some cases, over 1% um, since the start of the year. That's a very direct way to, to gauge the success of our LSAT program, which is just another way of, of lowering interest rates. Yes, yeah, so I, I would agree with um, uh, Jung's assessment there. Um, one of the important uh, backdrops to this is that the Reserve Bank has been uh, doing research on alternative monetary policies for quite uh, um, some time now and drawing on experience, experiences from other countries. And uh, that information and uh, that knowledge has been particularly important uh, to inform our deliberations. And uh, there's no doubt the LSAT program has helped uh, calm the volatility that was initially evident in financial markets. It's brought more confidence and trading into the, the government and uh, other bond markets. It's lowered yields across the uh, yield, that's, uh, yield curve. Uh, and in doing so, it's reduced uh, bank funding costs and lowered mortgage rates. Uh, and there are a number of channels by which this can take place. Uh, and uh, all of those channels um, have been supporting uh, the effectiveness of the, pro of the LSAT program. I, I might turn to one of those channels, um, Bob, that, you did, that um, I guess has been important. In the MPS, we did talk about uh, the LSAPs having to, uh, pushing down interest rates, but also lowering the exchange rate. 
Now, we haven't seen that channel being quite as effective, and I guess the question is why. Oh, well, um, yeah, thank you, Patrick. Um, well, the, the way in which LSAP's impact on our interest rates and, and economic activity are through impinging on and, and supporting liquidity, uh, reducing interest rates, there are portfolio balance effects and there's some policy signalling going on that's helping support the economy as well and um, bringing a bit more confidence into markets. But certainly the exchange rate is another uh, channel by which uh, monetary policy can help support the economy by reducing interest rates and the relative attractiveness of um, New Zealand uh, bonds and other interest-bearing assets compared to overseas. But it's not the only influence on the exchange rate. There are a host of other influences, such as confidence in uh, markets overseas, uh, the uh, view that investors have of, say, the US market vis-a-vis -vis the New Zealand market. So we're not a hostage to the exchange rate, but it, we recognise it's a helpful channel if we can get some support through that one. Yeah. And, and I'd, I'd just add also, you know, um, the exchange rate is a relative price. Um, it's the New Zealand dollar against um, the currency of another country. Um, and what's happening globally is that actually all central banks around the world are also embarking on, a, on, on their own form of um, monetary easing. So um, we can't just look at the exchange rate in isolation of our actions. It's in the context of everyone else trying to do the same thing as well. Why don't we turn to some of these additional tools that you're um, uh, asking Reserve Bank staff to prepare. Um, mainly in particular, let's focus on two of them, which is the negative OCR or negative uh, interest rates uh, and the uh, funding for lending program. I guess, first up, just negative uh, rates. Can you just explain to everybody what are we actually talking about? Should I comment there, Jung? Um, yeah, you have a crack, Bob. Yeah. Um, so uh, you touched on it, Patrick, when you mentioned negative OCR. So in the first instance, uh, the idea is to reduce the official cash rate uh, as far as we can because um, – and, and that's – so that – it's another way in which – we can support uh, the economy and try and reduce interest rates across the board. So um, the important point to recognise, it's uh, a, a way of using the price mechanism directly, uh, whereas the LSAT program, you're using quantities um, by, by entering the bond market, you're affecting the quantity of uh, settlement cash balances and uh, influencing interest rates through the intervention in the bond market. So this is more direct, more direct um, intervention and very much similar to the way in which we used the OCR in uh, previous years. Um, and so that's the big picture. Uh, and it changes in banks' incentives about holding settlement cash balances. And uh, the idea is to in increase the incentive for them to use those ba settlement cash balances more aggressively in their lending programs uh, and um, that way support economic activity. Uh, Jung, do you want to elaborate any further on that? Yeah, um, I think it's also important to, to keep our eye on the prize. You know, what we're trying to do is when we talk about monetary stimulus is actually just lower retail interest rates for households and businesses. Um, we might get, you know, excited or you might hear a lot of commentary about a negative OCR or a negative interest rate. We don't expect your mortgage rates or your deposit rates to go negative. But what we're talking about really is that they, we think there is room for those things to fall from where they are, but they will remain positive. So don't worry, you won't be forced to pay money to the bank to keep your money there. Likewise, the bank won't be paying you to take out a mortgage. Um, but just like we've done with LSAPs, we've just had to find different ways um, to lower those retail interest rates that households and businesses face. In a way, it's sort of like a beltway issue, really. You know, a lot of people will get excited about it, but for the vast majority of New Zealanders, you will never even experience a negative rate. You, you don't need to worry about it. You'll just experience the possibility that your mortgage rate or your business lending rate would go lower. Okay. We are talking about running it uh, in conjunction with a funding for lending program. 
can you again let's let's go through this what are we actually talking about here and why do you see the need for it to work together with a negative uh with negative rates yeah um i'll have, I'll have a crack at this one first bob and you can you can come in with your your wisdom at the end um so i always talk about wholesale rates in the economy um they are sort of your baseline your benchmark uh, and then what banks do is they take, they can borrow at those wholesale rates. They put their margin on and what households and businesses face is the retail rate. So what LSAPs have done um, is they've indirectly lowered wholesale rates, government bond rates. Um, and you've seen that flow through to mortgage rates so far. They've come down further. Um, but there will be a natural limit to how far much further we can push those wholesale rates down through this LSAP program. Uh, what a negative OCR and this funding for lending for pro uh, lending program will do is just take it that one step further. If we can lower those wholesale rates a little bit further um, by th through a negative OCR and provide an opportunity for banks to borrow at those lower rates, then they can pass those cost savings on to households and businesses in the form of lower mortgage rates. So that's that's in a nutshell what we're trying to achieve. Um, that's right. And uh, just to um, comment on why, uh, why in combination with uh, negative interest rate policy, it can act as a complement. Um, negative interest rates, um, um, negative settlement cash, or the OCR, does impinge on uh, the interest rate margins for banks. Well, the way in which funding for lending can complement that process, it allows banks to borrow from the Reserve Bank at um, relatively low um, funding costs. And uh, in that way, it provides some support to the banking system to help them maintain uh, lending to the private sector to support the economy. Thank you for that. Um, well, look, you've raised this now in terms of uh, raising this kind of publicly that these tools are, uh, could be next cabs off the rank. I guess get, how urgent is the need for these new measures that you are preparing? Um, that's that's a decision to, to come and it is contingent on the economic outlook um, and it's contingent on how successful we are at, at um, supporting the economy. So we're sort of at the, the beginning of the economic recovery phase. So to the extent that um, low interest rates um, aren't sufficient where they are to, to stimulate more activity and, and higher levels of employment, we may need to be to do more, but that's a, that's a, to be determined. Um, what we're trying to talk about now is being actively prepared. So if and when the time comes and if and when the, the Monetary Policy Committee um, thinks we need more stimulus, we have those um, tools available at our disposal. What conditions would you need to see in order to make this package necessary? Well, banks, um, you know, if we're talking about a negative OCR, banks just have to be operationally ready to, to, to do that, right? And, and this is a program we've, we've talked to the banks um, at the start of the year and, and they are getting ready towards the end of this year. So the earliest we could, um, you know, I guess, uh, implement some of these, these next strategies would be around that time frame. We had a question from uh, Keith Poor. He was asking about the uh, international evidence of the effectiveness of negative interest rates compared with yield curve control. Um, look, I might just ask you in answering this question just to explain just quickly what yield curve control is. Okay. <laughs> yield curve control, it's another fancy term. It's essentially rather than um, announcing an, an LSAT program in terms of the amount of government bonds we want to buy um, to lower interest rates, um, you know, through a quantity measure, why not just announce the, the level that we want to see interest rates at? Um, so um, the way I would describe that, it, it, they're just sort of two, two, um, two sides of the same coin. We want to get lower interest rates lower. Um, what's the most effective way of doing it? Um, and we think um, buying government bonds and, and giving people the confidence that we're, we're gonna be buying a certain amount um, is the way to achieve that in New Zealand. Um, on the question of uh, international evidence on the effectiveness of, of negative interest rates, um, I would say the evidence is, um, there is reasonably strong evidence that negative interest rates do work at stimulating higher levels of credit growth. And again, negative wholesale rates. Um, the way it's worked is that negative wholesale rates have been effective at lowering retail interest rates that households and businesses face, and that in itself has been successful at stimulating 
high levels of credit demand and then high levels of, high levels of economic activity than otherwise. So yes, there is evidence that this thing works. Um, yes, we are actively preparing as to what that would look like for New Zealand. Um, and if and when we need to, uh, I think we'd have the confidence to, to implement those tools. Um, one of the questions that we're seeing with the QE uh, in particular is around the, is it creating a nation in New Zealand of have and have nots? I mean, are the Reserve Bank's actions uh, for QE just for the rich in propping up asset prices? Oh, I'll um, uh, comment on that, if you like, uh, Patrick, in the first instance. Um, the biggest threat uh, to uh, inequality, whether we're talking about income inequality or inequality in wealth, is in fact the pandemic itself. Um, and uh, the, the disruption it's causing to um, people's job opportunities, to business investment, uh, and so forth. Um, so the way in which that would uh, be a threat to or impinge on inequality is that those who are unfortunate to uh, have their job prospects uh, taken away from them as a result of the uh, pandemic, uh, that will increase inequality. Those that uh, it could impact on uh, jobs and incomes and how in another way it can impact on household equity, um, equity in the home, that could impact on wealth inequality. So the biggest threat is the pandemic itself. Uh, another way is that the downturn causes stranded assets and, and bankruptcies. Monetary policy, uh, the objective of monetary policy is to support, um, support the economy uh, to try and mitigate those effects. Now, there, um, no matter which monetary policy instrument we apply, there will be some consequences of that some side effects, and we, we certainly do uh, think very seriously about those when we're making our decisions. But bear in mind, the objective of monetary policy is to try and maintain employment and try and maintain economic activity to, af to um, avoid some of the more serious effects on incomes, jobs, and, and assets that uh, the pandemic could cause. Well, um, Jung, can I go to you on this then too? Is uh, I guess for um, a lot of people, uh, and, and particularly for firms, um, you could argue that the Reserve Bank is putting a lot of effort into providing liquidity to ensure that it's out there, but you can't compel people to borrow and you can't compel people to spend. So isn't it just at this present time, you, you could do all these things, but really... At the end of the day, you are just propping up asset prices. Yeah, uh, that's we get that line of questioning a lot. Um, so two two reflections. One is, um, what would the outlook be like if we sat on our hands and did nothing? You know, because that's sort of the the logical extension of that question. You know, you, we are taking these actions and it's having these consequences. Well, flip it around. If we did nothing and, and instead, what would then be the consequences? And is that a, a, a different or a better outcome that people would choose? Um, the, the the other way I'd answer is absolutely. We are we are confident that lower interest rates do provide higher levels of economic stimulus. It does result in more employment in the economy than otherwise, and that is absolutely what the economy needs right now um, to get to the other side. Um, we don't have perfect tools at our disposal. Um, we can't dial up interest rates or dial our interest rates for everyone in their own perfect situation. Um, we are conscious that lower interest rates make cash flow better for people with debt servicing mortgage or, and debt servicing obligations. Um, and in due course, it will stimulate higher levels of borrowing and investment. Um, we're gonna need all of those things um, to get through this economic recovery. We had a question, uh, we, had actually, we had a number of questions from the public um, are, are just around why the Reserve Bank uh, doesn't buy bonds directly from the government at zero cost or consider helicopter money. I get a fair question. Why doesn't the bank do this, Bob? Okay. 
I yep. can probably pick um, it up. Um, I think Bob's just frozen us for, for the time being. Um, if I could paraphrase Bob, and I, I know exactly what he'd say, <laughs> it would be along the lines of, well, what we're doing currently is working. Uh, if we, you know, our eye on the prize, we want to lower interest rates because low interest rates do stimulate high levels of activity and employment. Um, our LSAP actions currently are, are effective at doing that. So we haven't had to reach to some of these other tools that people are considering. Um, and, and the second thing is, you know, the, the essence of that question is it's almost a sense of, well, if only we would do something else that would fix the situation, it would be this magic solution or there's a free lunch out there. And, and, I, and I just have to reinforce there is no um, there are no shortcuts here. There are no free lunches to be had in trying to solve this difficult economic situation in front of us. Um, just a, an additional question that we had from uh, Anton Osborne. Uh, he asked, uh, look, whether the Reserve Bank would consider a debt write-off. Yeah, again, this sort of falls into the other, well, what are these other options out there that we're not um, considering? Um, and to me, well, firstly, we're an investor. We are buying government bonds, so it's not actually up, for, up to us to, to write off that debt. We're actually the asset holder. Um, and, you know, again, you have to think hard about what is to what end, to what purpose um, would, a, would a debt write-off solve? So yeah, there is no shortcut. Um, there is no obvious answer we're missing by by not considering these other options. You know, I might just. Um, it seems I think we've lost Bob for the duration just for this end, uh, yep. unfortunately. Um, look, just very just quickly, just around um, bank behaviour. Uh, look, we. we we know that banks out there from some of the surveys that have been held is they have tightened their lending criteria, particularly for business. Are you satisfied that they are doing all that they can for their customers? Yeah, that, and that's a, a good question. And it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. And um, I'm not here to pass judgment. Um, what I would say is, you know, banks have been very good at um, maintaining operational capability through through this period. And that's very important, you know, the ability to, to continue to service customers. They have passed through lower interest rates, our actions through to, to mortgages. That's, that's great to see. And, and that should continue. Um, I guess, again, the challenge is going to be in front of us, isn't it? Um, we need banks to be part of the solution. They have to be able to bridge the economy through to the other side by continuing to make credit available at, at sufficiently the right price. Um, we are hearing anecdotes of sort of concerns about tightening lending standards or refusing to accept new customers. Um, those are kind of dangerous um, anecdotes to be hearing. Um, we are, banks entered this um, economic contraction, well capitalized and profitable. They're here for the long term, and we're just encouraging them to think about their role in this um, and making sure they're part of the solution, not adding to the problem we're already facing. Yo, thank you very much for that. Um, that's all the time that we have for now. Uh, my thanks to Jung and Bob, wherever you may be right at this very moment. Um, We'd also like to thank you, uh, everybody on the call, for joining us. Uh, now, look, we didn't get a chance to uh, ask all the questions uh, that we uh, had. Um, for those that we didn't uh, have time to answer, we will get back to you by email. So, Matiwa, and goodbye.